Assalamu alaikum and thank you so much for tuning into Kosh from Musliman. This is our 11th podcast and we had recorded this podcast in the month of September. But due to Israel's colonial war on Gaza and Palestine, we decided to withhold the release of the podcast, but today we would finally be releasing this podcast. In this podcast today, we would be in conversation with Professor Sher Ali Tareen, who has been a guest on the podcast previously as well. Today we would be talking to him about his book that recently came out called Perilous Intimacies Debating Hindu Muslim Friendship After Empire. In this groundbreaking book, Professor Sherali Tareen explores how leading South Asian Muslim thinkers, the ulama, imagined and contested the boundaries of Hindu Muslim friendship from the late 18th to the mid 20th centuries. Perilous Intimacies considers a range of topics including Muslim scholarly translations of Hinduism, Hindu-Muslim theological polemics, the question of inter-religious friendship in the Quran, intra-Muslim debates on cow sacrifice and debates on emulating Hindu customs and habits. He asks, how did the Muslim scholars grapple with the possibilities and dangers the promise and peril of hindu muslim friendship how did they negotiate the incongruities between foundational texts and attitudes toward non muslims that were informed by the pre modern context of muslim empire and the realities of british colonialism which rendered south asian muslims a political minority professor sher ali tareen is an associate professor of religious studies at franklin and marshall college he is also the author of defending muhammad in modernity so professor sherali your book is named perilous intimacies now when we usually imagine intimacy or when we think of intimacy we think of it as precisely the realm that does not carry peril and we see peril as a condition of the lack of intimacy or friendship but in your introduction you describe what friendship is building on the likes of alexander nehamas derrida karl schmidt and the discursive tradition of islam friendship you say is both a promise and a peril and paraphrasing derrida you say that friendship is only possible alongside the wound of enmity peril then seems to be the condition of the possibility of intimacy or friendship you also talk about the close entanglement of friendship with the promise of sovereignty or authority as exemplified by the arabic category of wilaya or through the idea of hospitality or derrida's hospitality and you tie this theorization of friendship with the question of hindu muslim friendship after the empire talk to us about all of this and please introduce the book to us thank you so much ahmed uh, for your invitation and uh, for your very close reading of the book i'm very honored and delighted to be in conversation with you so this book primarily is a book on intra muslim scholarly debates and contestations on the theme of hindu muslim friendship uh, from the mid 18th to the mid 20th century in south asia and the main objective of this book is to take the case study of intra muslim scholarly debates on the limits and boundaries of inter religious friendship especially hindu muslim friendship to examine and showcase the depth complexities ambiguities and fissures of muslim intellectual traditions especially to do with uh, the traditionalist uh, scholars of south asia the ulama Uh, in early modern and uh, modern uh, south asia on the theme of friendship i think i will talk about two main ideas that are also connected to the main theme and argument of the book the first idea is that i am primarily interested in this book to explore uh, the promise and the peril of hindu muslim friendship of how hindu muslim friendship was seen by authoritative muslim scholars as offering particular Uh, you know a, a promise particular benefits uh, you know uh, uh, politically and otherwise but how hindu muslim friendship was also read as a threatening peril uh, 
uh, by competing groups of Muslim scholars. Uh, so there, of course, I am in many ways inspired, both in terms of my readings in uh, Western philosophical thought on the theme of friendship and also in Muslim intellectual history on this theme, where, for example, if you look at uh, philosopher Alexander Nehemas, whom you mentioned in your question, uh, in his really interesting intellectual survey of this idea of uh, friendship in Western philosophical thought, he talks about this idea of the double face of friendship, whereby, you know, friendship uh, with uh, uh, a friend who is morally and politically beneficial to you uh, can offer all kinds of promise. Uh, but if you are bound to a morally harmful friend, that can also bring uh, quite a degree of peril uh, to you as a person and to your community, more broadly speaking. Similarly, Jacques Derrida, of course, famously talked about friendship being ineluctably bound and inescapably, inescapably connected to the wound of enmity, as he called it. Um, so I was really interested in connecting this idea of the promise and peril of friendship to intra-Muslim debates, intra-Muslim scholarly contestations on inter-religious friendship as offering both a promise and a peril at different historical moments to do with different themes connected with the idea of friendship. The category in Muslim intellectual thought that corresponds most closely to the way I approach friendship, or that comes up rather more dominantly in my examination of uh, South Asian ulama traditions in early modern and modern South Asia, is the category of muwalat, uh, which of course comes from uh, the roots waliya, from which we also get uh, terms like wali, uh, the friend of God or Sufi master, and of course awliya, it's plural, or the terms wilaya and walaya, oftentimes translated as uh, 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 sainthood. So in relation to that category, it's quite interesting to note that uh, you know, these terms of wilaya and walaya, although, of course, they mean friendship um, and intimacy, but they can also, of course, mean the idea of sovereignty. Uh, you know, a wali is someone who is close to you, someone who is uh, 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 has a relationship of intimacy, for example, the friend of God. Uh, but the wali is also someone who has the authority to command, uh, which is how uh, Raghib al-Isfahani, this famous you know, uh, author of a dictionary of Quranic terms, Al-Mufradat fi Gharib al-Quran, how he talked about this idea of, uh, of uh, uh, wilaya. Um, so, in terms of its emic sensibility in Islam, the idea of muwalat has this kind of a dual uh, you know, meaning, this kind of a dual etymology whereby it, rep it, 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 it signifies both friendship and intimacy, but also sovereignty or the authority of command or the authority to dispose uh, and so on. So I, in this book, am primarily interested in this relationship between friendship and sovereignty. That, in some ways, is the main conceptual theme running through the book of how competing projects, of how competing intellectual uh, you know, models and visions of Hindu-Muslim friendship are connected with and uh, get mapped onto competing visions and notions of Muslim sovereign power in a political context of South Asia, early modern and modern South Asia, marked by the loss of Muslim political sovereignty. So basically, when Muslims lose their political sovereignty in South Asia, how does that moment in different discursive theaters, in different thematic registers, uh, ushers this intra-Muslim debate precisely on the relationship between friendship and sovereignty, uh, on the relationship between the limits and boundaries of Islam in relation to the Hindu other and uh, varied notions of how Muslim sovereign power uh, has to be uh, you know, preserved and, and enshrined in the absence of Muslim political sovereignty. So this tension between friendship and sovereignty or this relationship between friendship and sovereignty is very central to how I approach the category of friendship. And to just read from the book, uh, from page four early on, I describe how I approach the category of friendship, where I write that uh, I approach friendship as a relationship or encounter of intimacy, collaboration, cooperation, or hospitality with the other that while affording particular benefits, opportunities, and forms of power and pleasure, also renders untenable exclusive claims to the purity and sovereign ownership of the self. So this uh, you know, tense relationship between friendship and sovereignty, whereby in friendship, when you're 
uh, in ineluctably entangled with the other and with the contingencies of the other that in itself is a marker uh, and a an announcement of the absence of the sovereignty over the self so this um, the relationship between friendship and sovereignty in some ways is the central conceptual theme binding through the six chapters of this book and the last thing i will say on friendship is that in this book um, uh, i approach friendship through a much broader uh, lens than the commonplace notion of friendship as good relations or congeniality that we have in english today to also include things such as political collaboration translation of the other you know jacques derrida famously called um, translation as the condition of all hospitality and uh, inspired by that is the first chapter on muslim scholarly translations of hinduism um, and to also include things such as imitation of habits customs and rituals in everyday life so i approach friendship through a much broader lens to also include things like political collaboration translation imitation um, but the larger objective is a detailed study of uh, uh, some well known and others less well known but equally important muslim scholars in early modern and modern south asia on this idea of interreligious friendship and how then uh, their conceptions of hindu muslim friendship mapped uh, get mapped onto competing visions of muslim sovereignty in south asia in the absence of muslim political sovereignty so i'll i'll maybe pause there and continue the conversation with your next question thank you so much professor shere ali for this very helpful uh, introduction to your work now speaking of interreligious translation in the first chapter of your work which by the way constantly reminded me of this very beautiful text of walter benjamin called task of the translator you delve into this figure called mirza mazhar jane jana and his translation of hinduism for his muslim audience in the 18th century and you say that jane jana's translation of hindu thought and praxis represents a fascinating and hugely instructive case of interreligious translation that while according the hindu other remarkable theological and doctrinal hospitality was nonetheless tethered to a muslim political theology committed to upholding the exceptionality of islam's normative authority you argue then that jani janan then seems to preclude the imposition of binaries such as inclusivist exclusivist on him and his thought and thereby you also critique the framing of his project of translation as a secular project and if i am reading it right jani janan's hospitality seems to be the hospitality that derida speaks about where you have the greeting and the lodging of the foreign other as a friend in one's house on the condition that the host remains the patron the master and the final authority of the household and she also call his translation a domesticating approach to translation talk to us about this chapter Uh, thanks a lot for that question ahmed so the main theme of this chapter is the relationship between interreligious friendship uh, which is the central theme of the entire book and interreligious translation and in some ways this chapter is really inspired by uh, the famous statement by jacques derrida that translation is the condition of all hospitality so in this chapter i'm really interested in looking at ways in which uh, uh the the domain of interreligious friendship uh, emerges as one that presents the promise as well as the peril of interreligious friendship and the focus of this chapter is on this 18th century uh, uh, naqshbandi sufi master a famous urdu and persian poet uh, from delhi mirza mazhar jane janan who lived from 1699 to 1781 Uh, eight decades of tremendous political convulsions uh, in which uh, as many as 12 mogul rulers uh, ruled uh, and were uh, later dethroned so this pendulum of political sovereignty is uh, slowly but decisively shifting uh, from 
Mughal political sovereignty to uh, the encroaching uh, powers of British colonialism. And in the backdrop of that political uh, 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 change and transformation, Mirza Mazhar Jane Janan composes in 1750 uh, a letter which later gets published as a treatise in Persian, the objective of which was to translate Hindu thought, practice, texts for his Muslim audience. And there are a few major points that I make in relation to Jana Janan's uh, translation of Hinduism. First is that, on the one hand, Jana Janan conducts a very sympathetic and a very charitable translation of Hinduism. Um, and uh, at the crux of this translation project was the attempt to uh, posit equivalences between Islam and Hinduism which were centered on law and theology. So law and theology for him were the defining features or the defining aspects of uh, Hindu thought that he found to be uh, most uh, representative of uh, uh, this religious tradition that he was translating for his Muslim audience. And he found these equivalences between categories such as uh, uh, you know, Dharma Shastra, he said, is the same as Ilmul Kalam or dialectical theology in Islam. And Karma Shastra to do with applied duties uh, is the same as uh, Ilm Fiqh, uh, Ilm Ul Fiqh, uh, knowledge of jurisprudence. So, primarily, what I try to show in this chapter is that those parts of Islam that he thought were the most uh, important and the most uh, decisive uh, and the most distinguishing aspects of Islam, law and theology, those are the very aspects that he found to be distinguishing and the most important in relation to his object of translation, which was Hindu thought and practice. And for that, he primarily relied on uh, this uh, text called the Laws of Manu, uh, which is a text soaked in legal injunctions, uh, rather than other texts such as Mahabharata and so on, uh, which have more narratological uh, you know, points of emphasis and, and emphasis on questions of ethics as well. So that's one aspect of what I try to show, that uh, law and theology become the main units of equivalence for Mirza Mazhar Jana Janan. But at the same time as Jana Janan is very charitable uh, towards Hindu thought and practice, so for example, in addition to calling Hindu scholastic traditions as perfectly logical, as perfectly coherent, um, he also defends the Hindu practice of idol worship, in fact, by saying that this has no relationship or no comparison with the idol worship that we found among pre-Islamic pagans, because pre-Islamic pagans used to, uh, uh, you know, approach their idols as effective and agentive in and of themselves, whereas the Hindu practice of idol worship is much closer to the Sufi practice of meditating on the master's, uh, uh, you know, uh, face or tasavvur sheikh So, uh, and he also... Uh, uh, argued that uh, prophets and messengers may well have been sent to India. Uh, so he makes the point that, you know, there are Quranic verses which leave ambiguous uh, or leave unmentioned some of the uh, messengers which may have been sent. And those may well have been the messengers that were uh, sent uh, uh, to India. Um, and on the question of metempsychosis or the transference of one soul to another or what in, is called tanasukh, uh, he makes the argument that, look, if someone believes in it, uh, uh, you neither have to think that that person has to be charged with unbelief and neither do you have to think that that person does not have to be charged with unbelief. So he makes this kind of an ambiguous statement that they can be or cannot be charged for unbelief. So in general, it's a very charitable and a very fascinating uh, translation, the specific aspects of which I, of course, go into in the chapter, but I'm just giving you some highlights here. The general tenor is one of charity, is one of hospitality, is one of trying to convince his Muslim audience about the coherence, the uh, the soundness, uh, and the monotheistic credentials, most importantly, of uh, Hinduism, uh, in trying to present Hinduism as a, uh, you know, properly monotheistic tradition with a distinct law and theology. But at the same time, Jana Janan is very careful to make sure that this charity and hospitality does not undermine the exceptionality of Islam either, and that he continues to show his fidelity to Islamic exceptionalism. And the way that he does, he, that he tries to do that is by uh, positing that, you know, Hinduism may have been 
a tradition uh, you know that was legitimate before the coming of Islam but after the coming of Islam and after the career of Prophet Muhammad uh, these traditions have become abrogated so in some ways time and history served as the ultimate sovereign arbiter of the uh, distinction between the self and the other between religion and unbelief between identity and difference between um, uh, hospitality and hostility so to say so i'm really interested in this chapter to look at the relationship between uh, translation hospitality and temporality and the way in which jana jana is able to negotiate his extremely you know bordering on admiration almost uh, uh, evaluation of hinduism while at the same time remaining uh, 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 remaining loyal to a view of islam whereby islam is the uh, completor of history is the um, uh, you know tradition that completes the uh, the inadequacies of 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 time and history and with that my main objective again as it is throughout the book is to show that thinkers like jana janan were very sophisticated and uh, we cannot approach their thought in terms of the binary of inclusivism and exclusivism or uh, uh, you know uh, 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 pluralist or puritan uh, things that are a lot more complicated and more sophisticated than these kinds of binaries would allow and the final thing that i try to argue in this in this chapter is uh, that you know although the object of jana janan study does not quite correspond to a modern notion of hinduism as a world religion so in the 18th century and even in terms of the ways in which he refers to his object of study so he often times call them the ahle hind you know the people of india or uh, uh, when he's referring to them he just says you know uh, uh, things that have to do with their faith uh, you know az ishan uh, of theirs or uh, uh, his his references often times do not correspond with you know a modern notion of hinduism or modern notion of hindus uh, in the plural either in fact primarily his object to study has to do with brahmanical you know uh, traditions of knowledge uh, that he is very uh, admiring of uh, but at the same time that we cannot equate his object of study to a modern notion of a fully fledged world religion called hinduism nonetheless he did approach his translation project as involving Uh, you know translating and evaluating uh, a fully formulated uh, you know body of texts knowledge traditions practices uh, that may not correspond to hinduism but nonetheless it was not some kind of an amorphous and completely ambiguous uh, uh, you know object of translation either so i try to present and situate jana janan in these ongoing conversations in the western academy on the whole question of the continuities and the ruptures between pre-colonial and colonial uh, you know imaginaries and conceptions of religion and especially how that connects to the career of hinduism which is an object of tremendous debate in the western academy uh, with sophisticated arguments on both sides of the debate but i try to uh, you know intervene in that debate by uh, presenting the possibilities of the role that a thinker like jane janan and muslim translations of hinduism more broadly can play in terms of adding some nuance to that whole debate and my main argument there is that there are many aspects of his translation project that simulate that seem quite uh, you know uh, that resemble colonial notions of translation in terms of the attempts to uh, you know theologize hinduism laws of manu being the main you know reference point which was the case also with you know british orientalist scholars as gauri vishwanathan has shown um uh, in his attempt to show that uh, uh, this was a properly monotheistic tradition uh in making a distinction between hindu scholastic traditions on the one hand and then hindu popular practices like diwali holi that is much uh, more condemnatory towards and says that muslims must avoid these you know uh, popular practices on the grounds of this clear bifurcation between elite uh, knowledge traditions and popular practices that we also see in british colonial and orientalist uh, conceptions of religion but i end up arguing in the book that and in this chapter that despite the seeming similarities and the seeming resemblances nonetheless there is a very important difference between uh, colonial regimes of uh, uh, interreligious translation and jana janan's project of interreligious translation uh, and the main difference is that jana janan's translation of the hindu other was conducted primarily uh, with questions of community in mind how does one translate the other in ways that it would be more palatable to members of one's own community so that one can maintain some degree of uh, uh, 
you know, communal harmony or some degree of, uh, 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 you know, balance in terms of uh, the, the, the view of the self towards the other or the view of Indian Muslims towards Hinduism and Hindus. So his translation project in many ways is animated by questions of community. Whereas in the British colonial project, clearly we see interreligious translation or the translation of Hinduism as a world religion being uh, ineluctable with the larger project of secular governance, with the larger project of regulating the boundaries of religion as a category in the service of modern state sovereignty. And that is an element that we don't see in the labor, the translation labor of an actor like Jane Janan. Uh, so it is on that note that I conclude that chapter and I also engage Jane Janan's thought with some uh, uh, important and interesting conversations in the larger field of translation studies. Uh, and finally, I would say that this chapter, in addition to Jane Janan, also conducts a select but substantive genealogy of Indian Muslim engagements with Hindu thought, practice and history uh, from uh, Al-Biruni uh, in the medieval moment uh, all the way to uh, Jane Janan in the 18th century. Thank you so much, Professor, for your answer. Now, moving on to the third chapter of your book, and I found this chapter particularly fascinating because it resonates very deeply and speaks very profoundly and directly to the politics of the present. Now, in this chapter, you have two figures occupying the central place. You have Abul Kalam Azad and Ahmad Raza Khan Barelvi, and you have their divergent understanding and conception of Mu'alat. So you have Azad, and we're talking about the time of British colonization of this part of the world, arguing that Indians, in their struggle against British colonization, must abandon all relations with the British and ally themselves with the Hindus in this particular anti-colonial struggle. On the other hand, you have Khan chastising Azad and those who thought like him for enabling Hindu-Muslim intimacy, which he felt was a greater peril for Muslims than British colonization as it would lead to the erasure of the very Muslim self. Now, underlying their difference with each other, you have two divergent understandings of the idea of friendship or mu'alat. And you argue that despite their disagreements, both Azad and Khan upheld distinct imperial Muslim political theologies. For Azad, this theology was nestled in the institution of the Ottoman Caliphate, which he defended very vigorously, because for him, the Caliphate was the precondition for the possibility of performing one's religion in the public sphere. While for Khan, it was the preservation of the markers of Muslim distinction in everyday ritual life that secured sovereign power in the absence of Muslim political sovereignty. You also argue that when we engage with the thought of somebody like Ahmad Raza Khan Barelvi and Abul Kalam Azad and their life and their engagements with each other, binaries such as fundamentalist, modernist, which are often imposed when Muslim discursive tradition is read and understood, these binaries tend to collapse. Talk to us about this chapter. So chapters three and four both are focused on the context of the Khilafat movement, uh, which is a historical moment almost exactly one century ago uh, that was particularly pulsating in the year 1920. And these two chapters, uh, let me first focus on chapter three that you asked me a question about. This chapter is focused on an intra-Muslim debate that oftentimes was acerbic enough that it can be called a polemic between uh, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, the famous uh, Muslim modernist thinker who nonetheless was very familiar with and very much attuned to Muslim traditionalist uh, or ulama traditions of knowledge, him on the one hand, who was a major doyen of the Khilafat movement, and on the other hand, the founder of the Barelvi school, uh, uh, the formidable and towering uh, Maulana Ahmad Raza Khan, who died in 1921. And the main object of debate between these two scholars uh, was the question of how should one think about the limits and boundaries of inter-religious friendship in terms of this triangular relationship between the British, the Muslims and the Hindus, whereby the British colonial state uh, was uh, 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 showing its uh, aggressive uh, designs against the Ottoman state. Uh, and the whole question was, should Muslims 
ally themselves with Gandhi and the Indian National Congress and the Hindu community more broadly speaking to forge a united front against the British colonial state who was harboring, you know, these colonial designs of aggression towards the Ottoman state. Or uh, would that kind of an alliance or friendship with the Hindus and with Gandhi and the Indian National Congress in uh, particular uh, be dangerous and be perilous for Indian Muslim identity and the practice of religion in everyday life or not? So that was the main question at stake. And these two scholars debated this question of the limits um, and the allowance of inter-religious friendship uh, by presenting competing readings of the tradition, of the canonical legal tradition, and also competing readings, especially of two specific verses in the Quran, uh, verses 8 and 9 of chapter 60 of Surah Mumtahana, uh, the relevant parts of which I'm, I'll paraphrase here. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, these two verses say that God does not forbid you from showing kindness to those unbelievers who are not aggressive towards you, who do not fight you uh, on account of your faith or uh, aid others in fighting you or throw you out of your homes. God only forbids you from showing kindness to those unbelievers who do these things, who uh, 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 are aggressive uh, towards you uh, because of your faith or uh, 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 who abet others uh, in driving you forth from your homes. Uh, you know, uh, So the debate then centered on how should one interpret these two verses. And the main question was that in the context of South Asia, who were the non-Muslims who were uh, deserving of kindness and friendship? You know, those who were not aggressive towards you, those who did not throw you out of your homes or aid others in driving you forth? And who were the non-Muslims who did all these things? And Abul Kalam Azad was very clear in his answer to this question that for him, Hindus were the first kind of non-Muslims uh, who were uh, not aggressive uh, and had not abetted others in, uh, you know, uh, 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 driving Muslims out of their homes. And the British, with their designs to crumble and crush the Ottoman state, which uh, for Abul Kalam Azad was the caliphate of the time, uh, was a non-Muslim entity that was undeserving of kindness and friendship. And hence he argued that uh, Indian Muslims uh, should completely sever and completely abandon all relations of uh, subjecthood, all relations of friendship, all relations of, uh, uh, you know, even everyday uh, uh, transactions uh, with the colonial state, uh, this idea of severing uh, severing one's ties, of course, is what he called tarke mowalat, or you know, severing uh, all ties of uh, uh, friendship or clientage uh, with the British state. And he also argued that it was an individual obligation for all Indian Muslims to launch jihad, to launch a you know a war against uh, the British state. So his main argument was that in the conditions that existed, you know, in the 1910s and especially by the, you know 1919 and 1920 when the Khilafat movement was rolling ahead in uh, full steam, that basically the religious obligations of Indian Muslims, which was to preserve the caliphate, uh, were directly uh, 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 at odds with and directly collided with their uh, role as citizens of the British Empire. And the two most fascinating aspects of his argument uh, were that on the one hand, Abul Kalam Azad's whole argument, uh, which I do a very close reading of uh, from this famous text of his, uh, though less, I think, examined in the Western Academy, called uh, 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 Mas'ala Ye Khilafat, uh, The Problem of the Caliphate, and it also has the title uh, Jaziratul Arab, or the Arabian Peninsula, in which he makes a case for the non-negotiable nature of the caliphate in Islam. And he makes a point that, uh, which has some precedent, as well that, uh, uh, you know, Muslim obligations, even like praying and fasting and giving charity, will have no meaning in the absence of the primary fulcrum of Muslim religious and political life, and that was the caliphate. Uh, and that was represented by the Ottoman state. Uh, so in terms of arguing for the non-negotiability of the caliphate, uh, uh, that was the central part of his argument. And the other central part of his argument was, interestingly, that... Uh, uh, that he was trying to remind the British colonial state of its own responsibility to its own principles of secularism. That by attacking the Ottoman Caliphate, uh, the British had intervened in a matter of tremendous religious sensitivity for Indian Muslims and had intervened in matters of religion and had failed to abide by its own principle of the separation of religion and the state. So it's very interesting to look at, on the one hand, Abul Kalam Azad is articulating uh, a decisively Muslim imperialist uh, 
political theology, which is based on the non-negotiable character of the caliphate, and that it's an obligation, an individual obligation, uh, Fardul Ain, on all Indian Muslims to preserve the caliphate by even taking up arms against uh, the British by, and by severing all ties of citizenship and subjecthood that they have with the British state. But on the other hand, the same Abul Kalam Azad, in addition to having this very Muslim imperial view and standpoint, is also borrowing from the language of liberalism and from, from the language of secular power by making the argument precisely uh, on the turf of British liberalism itself that uh, you know intervening in a matter of religious sensitivity contravenes the very principle of secularism. Anyway, so as a counterpoint to this argument, uh, Ahmad Azahan, whose argument is also extremely interesting and sophisticated, and again, I won't be able to go into the details here, uh, but his main argument uh, pivoted on uh, two crucial counterpoints, uh, one of which was that uh, one cannot approach Hindus as a community uh, which had not fought Muslims on the basis of religion or who had not you know, thrown Muslims out of their homes. Uh, he uh, argued that that happens you know, village to village in India and he made the argument uh, that you know, try sacrificing a cow in any a town or village uh, where there is a majority Hindu population and see what happens to you. So on the one hand, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, verse 8 of Surah Mumtahana, Hindus do not correspond to a community who have not fought against you on account of religion. Um, and when, you know, the Khilafat movement leaders or scholars argued that, look, we're not talking about, uh, uh, you know, all Hindus, but in general, these are people who are kind to you and don't throw you out of your homes. Some of them may engage in these violent practices, but not all of them. Uh, to that, Ahmad Raza Khan responded that, okay, in that case, that, you know, not all British uh, uh, people uh, uh, harbor, uh, you know, uh, evil designs against the Ottoman state either. It's some British people from the uh, from the British state, rather. So this, you know, the import of these verses does not uh, um, uh, does not correspond to each and every member of a community being, you know, uh, hostile or not hostile. And the other argument that he made, uh, uh, Ahmad Raza Khan, and that's basically, uh, you know, the most substantive and the most important aspect of his argument, was that by engaging the Hindu community in a relationship of friendship and intimacy, muwalat, that would undermine and eventually erase the markers of Muslim distinction in the public sphere. Uh, Shi'ar Islam, or the plural, of course, Shi'ar Islam or Sha'a'irul Islam in Arabic, uh, the distinctive markers uh, such as cow sacrifice, such as prayers in mosques and so on, uh, the distinctive ritual markers that distinguish religious identity and difference in the public sphere. And for him, in the absence of Muslim political sovereignty, in the absence of a Muslim state, it was precisely and primarily in the regulation and the choreography of everyday ritual life that Muslim sovereign power was enshrined and should be preserved. And that's what he saw threatened by the uh, uh, Khilafat movement project of people like Abul Kalam Azad to, uh, uh, to promote uh, Hindu-Muslim friendship and intimacy through this kind of a political collaboration between Gandhi and uh, the uh, uh, Khilafat movement. So to sum up, what I show in this chapter is that both of these thinkers, in fact, had competing visions both of an imperial Muslim political uh, theology and competing understandings of the category of muwalat or friendship. That on the one hand, uh, someone like Abul Kalam Azad uh, 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 situated sovereignty uh, in the institution of the caliphate that to him was represented by the uh, Ottoman state. Uh, and I show in detail in this chapter how Abul Kalam Azad also tries to counter against uh, the Muslim, uh, you know, traditionalist or the ulama position that since the Ottomans don't have uh, lineage of the Quraysh, that they can't be called legitimate, uh, you know, uh, caliphs. Uh, uh, so he counters that through a very interesting set of arguments, the details of which I won't go into right now. And in addition to that, uh, for uh, Abul Kalam Azad, his conception of Muwalat was primarily focused on this uh, element of the relationship between a state and the subjects. And for him, by intervening in a matter of religious sensitivity, the British state had completely contravened that contract between, uh, you know, uh, the state and the people. Um, so he basically focused on this element of the category of Muwalat uh, that has to do with the relationship between the state and its subjects. Whereas for Ahmad Raza Khan, he primarily approached Muwalat in terms of, you know, everyday interreligious friendship and intimacies. Uh, that to him, 
uh, threatened uh, the distinctive markers of Islam uh, in everyday ritual life. And to him, uh, uh, in, in addition to him, in addition to his conception of Mawalat, he also situated Muslim sovereign power uh, primarily in the realm of everyday ritual life. Uh, so basically what I show in this chapter is in the in the aftermath of Muslim political sovereignty, you know, after empire, which is also the title of the book, these are the competing ways in which ideas of friendship uh, through categories like Mawalat uh, were debated and contested through competing readings of the Quran and competing readings of uh, the canon of both Hanafi law and, and beyond. Thank you so much, Professor, for your answer. And this very neatly ties to uh, the fourth chapter of your work. Now, here again, we meet Molana Ahmed Raza Khan Barelvi. But this time, primarily in conversation with Molana Abdul Bari of Firangi Mahal. Now, scholars of Khilafat movement urged Muslims not to engage in cow slaughter so as to not offend the normative sensibilities of Hindu community. Now, this encouragement, however, to abandon cow slaughter was not done through and in the language of liberal pluralism, but instead it was done through a reading, a particular reading of the fiqh tradition, which deems generally cow sacrifice as merely permissible, as merely mabah, and not wajib. Now, this was argued by the likes of Maulana Abdul Bari, but for others, like Ahmad Raza Khan Barelvi, Cow sacrifice was the symbol of Muslim distinction in India and forsaking it amounted to humiliation of Muslims and erasure of difference and distinction. Therefore, it was not permissible. He accepted that generally speaking, cow sacrifice was merely maba. But in the context of India, abandoning a distinctive symbol of Islam for appeasing and under the pressure of Hindus was completely forbidden. Hence, doing it actually becomes wajib and necessary. Now, to be fair, Mulan Abdul Bari also conceded that if there was pressure or coercion from Hindu community, then indeed Muslims were obligated to engage in cow slaughter. Talk to us about this. So this chapter in some ways continues with the context of Khilafat movement, but uh, it looks at uh, uh, the thought of two scholars uh, who are in many ways uh, major uh, 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 actors uh, in the terrain of uh, Muslim intellectual traditions in South Asia. On the one hand, this chapter continues with the thought of Ahmad Raza Khan, the founder of the Barelvi School. But it also introduces a scholar about whom not much has been written in the Western Academy, but he is uh, a towering figure uh, in this uh, tradition, uh, Malvi, uh, Malvi Abdul Bari of the Farangi Mahal School, uh, school of thought that, of course, and it, institution that is, of course, most well known for its focus on, uh, you know, the rational disciplines, the maqulat uh, and, uh, you know, logic and philosophy. And Abul, Abdul Bari, of course, was also a major uh, 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 a scholar connected to the Khilafat movement. The main theme of this chapter is debates on the question of cow sacrifice and the relationship between cow sacrifice and Hindu-Muslim friendship. And what I try to show in this chapter through a close reading of the views of Ahmad Raza Khan and uh, Malvi Abdul Bari is that for both of them, the cow, so to say, was pregnant with power. And either in the sacrifice of the cow or in the a cessation of a cow sacrifice, uh, both of these scholars held competing visions of Muslim sovereign power in the absence of Muslim political sovereignty. For On, on the one hand, for uh, Maulana Ahmad Raza Khan, cow sacrifice to him was among the distinctive markers of Islam in India. And he made this very interesting argument in this text of his, which was Rigid, uh, which was written originally as a legal opinion, as a fatwa, but uh, was extensive, as it is the case for many texts that uh, Ahmad Raza Khan wrote. So it was published as a treatise called The Finest Viewpoint on Cow Sacrifice, uh, Anfus al-Fikr fi Qurban al-Bakr. And this chapter does a very close reading of that text, uh, in which uh, Maulana Ahmad Raza Khan argued that, you know, um, generally cow sacrifice is uh, simply permissible according to the sharia, uh, that it's not uh, obligatory. Uh, 
Uh, but in the specific context of South Asia, it is in fact an obligation to continue cow sacrifice uh, because it is a distinctive marker of Islam, uh, uh, Shi'are Islam, and to seize its practice, to seize cow sacrifice under the pressure or the coercion of Gandhi and the Indian National Congress or the Hindu community more broadly would mean extinguishing a distinctive marker of Islam under the pressure, under the coercion of a non-Muslim community. And that would be completely um, contrary to the spirit and the purpose of the Sharia, which is to maintain the superiority and the sovereign uh, you know, supremacy of Muslims over non-Muslims. So that was at the crux of his legal argument. Um, and the other you know, parts of his argument were really fascinating that, you know, on the one hand, Ahmad Reza Khan made this you know, legal argument that you know, in the context of South Asia, uh, cow sacrifice uh, is not just simply permissible, but in fact is obligatory and you cannot seize it under the pressure coercion of a non-Muslim entity. On the other hand, he made the argument that uh, you know, the British colonial government should be the first to prevent that from happening. Why? Because the pressure for Indian Muslims to abandon cow sacrifice would contravene the very British colonial principle of religious freedom, uh, whereby a matter of tremendous religious importance to Muslims, that of sacrificing cows, uh, would be extinguished and would be, uh, you know, um, uh, would be blocked uh, because of the duress and the pressure of a non-Muslim community. So that would, in fact, go against the very principle of religious freedom or mazhabi azadi. Uh, then he also made the argument that, look, even in the Hindu tradition, when you look at the Vedas and you look at the whole Vedic, you know, ritual economy, Hindu gods, uh, there are clear, uh, you know, textual precedents of uh, Hindu gods uh, having made, uh, you know, sacrifice of uh, uh, of cows. And uh, that they, in fact, uh, as Ahmad Raza Khan put it, that the pleasures of beef uh, were not denied to them. Uh, so when there is debate and differing opinions even within Hinduism, why are we Muslims, Indian Muslims, being so enthusiastic about extinguishing a, distinct, a, a, a distinguishing marker of Islam? So I show how someone like Ahmad Raza Khan is very, uh, you know, dexterous and, 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 and very uh, uh, effective in terms of combining different, you know, elements from Muslim canonical uh, thought in terms of, you know, uh, uh, the tradition of uh, uh, Hanafi jurisprudence uh, from colonial law um, uh, to comparative readings of Hinduism uh, to stitch a broader argument that had to do with establishing cow sacrifice as among the distinctive markers of Islam and one that if denied to Muslims, especially under the pressure of uh, non-Muslims, uh, would be completely contrary to the Sharia and to colonial law at the same time. So I'm very interested in this chapter in terms of how someone like Ahmad Raza Khan brings together different threads and aspects of colonial law and the tradition of uh, you know, Hanafi jurisprudence in terms of the encounter between a pre-modern Muslim imperial logic of law in relation to Muslim-non-Muslim relations, its encounter with a modern British colonial understanding of law uh, for the maintenance of public order and for the regulation of re relations between different religious communities at the service of British state sovereignty. So the encounter between these two regimes of law and its different assumptions uh, is a very fascinating and frictious encounter that I try to uh, present uh, in this chapter. And Malvi Abdul Bari, on the other hand, whose thought is also looked at uh, uh, in much depth, he uh, makes the argument on the very turf of uh, Ahmad Raza Khan uh, by making the argument that, you know, if you're going to argue about distinctive markers of Islam, and he's very respectful, Malvi Abdul Bari in general, his temperament is not that polemical and not that aggressive or, uh, you know, fierce. He's, he's very respectful, and uh, but, in, but he is very explicit nonetheless in his argument that if distinctive markers of Islam will be the main, uh, you know, um, variable and the main uh, question at hand, then there is no marker of Islam which is more important, which is more uh, sacred uh, than the caliphate. Uh, and Malvi Abdul Bari makes this uh, really uh, poignant and powerful uh, statement uh, where he says that what is the cow when put next to the caliphate? So that's one aspect of his argument. Uh, that the caliphate is a much more important distinctive marker of Islam than cow sacrifice. Uh, 
But on the other hand, to make things more complicated, Maulvi Abdul Bari completely agrees with Ahmad Raza Khan and is very attentive and very sensitive to uh, making sure that he is not seen to be arguing that cow sacrifice is not an important marker of Muslim distinction for Indian Muslims. He completely agrees that it is so. He agrees with Ahmad Raza Khan on this point. And he even goes to the point of saying that if Hindus in fact... Uh, 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 you know, make Muslims do this under duress, uh, seizing cow sacrifice, that duress, in fact, will make this act obligatory, this otherwise simply permissible act that is neither obligatory nor forbidden, you know, which, which is part of the mubahat or acts which are simply permissible in the Sharia, that if Hindus uh, were, uh, 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 you know, acting uh, uh, in a way that uh, put Muslims under duress, to seize this practice, then this otherwise simply permissible practice will in fact turn into an obligation. So he's very explicit about that. So Malvi Abdul Bari, in slight contrast from Abul Kalam Azad, who I looked at, uh, who I look at in the chap in chapter three, is much more attentive, is much more sensitive to covering his traditionalist basis, and to making sure that he does not, uh, uh, you know, land in any kind of a traditionalist landmine. Um, in terms of making this argument. Uh, so he's very explicit in making the argument that, you know, Indian Muslims of their own volition, of their own agency, should seize cow sacrifice to maintain communal harmony so that a united front could be forged against the British colonial state, which has aggressive and colonizing designs against the Ottoman Caliphate. And he makes a fascinating argument that this relationship of Hindu-Muslim friendship that will be, you know, forged as a result of uh, giving up on cow sacrifice, uh, but out of one's own volition. This is something that Malvi Abdul Bari called an exception to the norm, harqul ada, an exception to the norm, which was to be instituted in this time and moment of emergency, when the most important marker of Islam, the caliphate, was under threat. So, in this moment of political theological tribulation. Uh, Muslims should uh, uh, forge a, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, a partnership with uh, Hindus uh, as a departure from the norm, as an exception to the norm, kharqul ada. So again, the main argument I try to make in this chapter then is that when you look at Ahmad Raza Khan's argument and Amalwi Abdul Bari's argument, you really cannot approach them from binaries like traditionalist, modernist. Uh, Ahmad Raza Khan is a devout traditionalist, but he is completely capable of mobilizing colonial law and reading Indian newspapers that he also mobilizes and saying that, you know, even in the Indian high courts, when, uh, uh, you know, judges are deciding on this matter, there, there are precedents even in, you know, Indian high courts in northern India where judges are making the point that, you know, uh, in the Vedas, uh, you do find examples of cow sacrifice and in Hindu gods, you know, did enjoy beef and so on. So the same, uh, you know, traditionalist thinker who could at times be seen as, you know, uh, uh, mired in the galaxy of pre-modern Hanafi jurisprudence or, you know, uh, Islamic legal thought more broadly, is perfectly capable of showing uh, pragmatism uh, in terms of dealing with colonial law or uh, reading, you know, uh, uh, newspapers and court uh, judgments on, on these qu questions. Um, so we cannot approach him through a, you know, a traditionalist or uh, a, an anti-modern uh, uh, kind of a framing. Uh, on the other hand, someone like Malbi Abdul Bari, on the one hand, he's making an argument which is for Hindu-Muslim intimacy, Hindu-Muslim friendship, uh, but at the same time, uh, which could be seen as a, you know, seemingly modernist project, but at the same time, he's very, very careful keep his traditionalist, uh, you know, basis covered. Uh, and he's very, very careful to articulate his argument in an idiom and in a fashion which would satisfy the uh, normative and hermeneutical or interpretive protocols of uh, Muslim traditionalism as well. So these debates, again, cannot be approached to the binaries of traditionalist, modernist, inclusivist, exclusivist, puritan, pluralist. Uh, that's, again, something that I show uh, in this chapter. And more specifically, what I show is how the cow and its death or life were invested in competing visions and imaginaries of Muslim political uh, uh, you know, power and sovereignty in the absence of a Muslim state for both uh, uh, Ahmad Raza Khan and Walbi Abdul Bari. Now, one of the very interesting ideas that you talk about or explore in your book 
is the idea of tashabbu. Um, tashabbu, as it's understood by Muslim scholars and Muslims in general, is the reprehensible imitation of non-Muslims. Now, this is based on the prophetic hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Man tashabbaha biqawmin fahuwa minhum which means that whoever imitates a people is from them. Now, obviously the question that arises from this prophetic hadith is imitating in what? So how does one define and delimit tashabbu? What is its scope? What are its limits? Now, as you argue, it was seen by Muslim scholars by and large as harmful intimacy and friendship with the other, which may lead to the erasure and indistinction of Muslims. So the hierarchy of the self and the other was maintained through avoiding tashabbu. Now, you discuss these questions by bringing forth the ideas on this subject of the likes of Ahmad Raza Khan, Rashid Gangohi, Qasim Nanotwi, Shah Abdul Aziz, and against them the likes of Sayyid Ahmad Khan. I found it particularly interesting, just as you did, how, for instance, Gangohi argued that the donning of English hats or suits in India during British colonization of India constituted tashabbu. However, donning the same hat in England did not constitute tashabbu because it did not represent a specific marker of non-Muslim community there. So commenting on Gangohi's view, you argue that the reprehensibility of imitation was attached to the way in which it breached a taboo. Now, talk to us about the intra-Muslim discussions on Tashabbu, especially if you could, Qari Tayyib's discourse on it, which I found particularly sophisticated and rich. You know, the main theme of this book, of course, is how are concepts invested in maintaining a Muslim-non-Muslim distinction and grounded in a context of Muslim imperial sovereignty. How are such concepts reread, refracted, negotiated, and contested as uh, objects of intra-Muslim debate uh, in the context of colonial modernity when uh, Muslim communities like that in South Asia have lost their political sovereignty? And in relation to this theme, which is the central uh, theme or question of uh, this book, uh, perhaps no other category is as intellectually and analytically fertile as that of uh, Tashabbu or reprehensible imitation of non-Muslims. Uh, this concept, of course, uh, comes from the hadith, the saying of the Prophet, uh, whoever imitates a community or a people becomes one of them. Man biqawmin fahuwa minhum. And in this chapter, I uh, engage both the pre-modern uh, um, discussions on this uh, concept uh, uh, by certain towering figures um, of Muslim intellectual thought, and then Chapter 5 of this book uh, conducts a uh, survey and um, an examination of a multiple number of scholars, how they have examined uh, this uh, context, uh, excuse me, this uh, uh, concept of uh, tashabbo in the South Asian context from multiple ideological persuasions. And one of them, whom you have mentioned in your question here, Rashid Ahmad Gangohi, one of the founders of the Deoband School, uh, he really makes a point and and it gives an example which gets to the heart of the question of Tashabbo, especially in its uh, South Asian uh, in instantiations, which is, you know, as you said, he argues that, you know, wearing something like a cross uh, or some kind of a religious symbol associated with a non-Muslim entity, uh, which is explicitly religious and devotional in its content, uh, would be impermissible and uh, would not cannot be allowed under almost any circumstance. But when he talks about a... Uh, uh, you know, a marker of um, non-Muslim community, like, you know, wearing uh, 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 suits and ties or an English hat, uh, he makes this very interesting and arresting observation that while wearing these articles of clothing, which are associated with uh, the British, would be impermissible for Indian Muslims within India, it would be completely permissible if that same article of clothing is worn in England. Why? Because in England, uh, this is not seen as something which is specific to, or it's not a taboo, which is only associated with the non-Muslim community. Uh, and hence, it would be completely fine when there is no such taboo or no such uh, uh, a marker of identity associated with this article of clothing. Uh, 
whereas in India, where that is so, it would be impermissible. So in a sense, this example really gets to the heart of the issue to do with the Shabbo, which is uh, at the heart of which is the whole idea of what are the kinds of mixture with the non-Muslim other, or what are the kinds of um, imitation that would confuse or that would uh, erase or extinguish Muslim distinction. That's basically the main question here. And that is a philosophical question, you know, at what point does confusion of identity, or at what point does the mixture of identity with the other uh, lead to the dwindling, uh, the extinction and the erasure of the self uh, is at the heart of uh, discourses on Tashabu. And this is something that we see particularly uh, 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 in particularly extensive and interesting ways in the thought of uh, Maulana Qari Tayyib, uh, who was, of course, the grandson of the other main founder of uh, the Oban Madrasa, Rashid Ahmad Gangu, who is, uh, you know, a uh, bosom friend, Qasim Nanutbi, his grandson, uh, Mala Nakari Tayyib, who's from the third generation of the Oban scholars. Uh, he wrote uh, what is the most extensive text on the idea of Tashabbo in the South Asian context, uh, a text uh, simply called a Tashabbo fil Islam, Tashabbo in Islam. And in this text, one of the main arguments that he makes is precisely that you know every entity, every form of being uh, has a particular kind of uh, form that it is associated with. So snakes come in a particular form, lions come in a particular form, humans come in their own form. So all ontological entities uh, have associated with them a particular form. And when that form starts getting mixed up, or when that form starts getting obfuscated, um, by an entity which has a different form, then that kind of mixture or that kind of obfuscation leads to the erasure and to the extinction of the entity that that form represents. So, for example, you know, if a, uh, a rope starts acting like a snake, uh, you know, after some time, people will associate that rope as a snake and not as a rope anymore. So, basically, uh, the, the the thrust of Qasim Nanotwi's discourse on Tashabbo was on the importance of maintaining distinction and how a mixture and obfuscation, uh, what, uh, you know, in Arabic and Urdu, ikhtilat and iltibas, ikhtilat or iltibas, how that um, undermines and eventually erases the distinction of uh, identity. And Qari Tayyib's text, at tashabuf al-Islam, was written as a direct rebuttal of the views of Sayyid Ahmad Khan, the famous Muslim modernist, but again, like Abul Kalam Azad, very much connected to and attuned to Muslim traditionalist knowledges. Sayyid Ahmad Khan, in his famous journal, Tahzeeb al Akhlaq, Polishing Ethics, had written uh, in very interesting and extensive ways about this idea of Tashabu, in which he was quite dismissive of the whole category by arguing that, you know, on the one hand, its uh, authenticity as a hadith is is doubtful, and he says that you know the chains of transmission are not to be relied on, from which we get tashabbu hadith. Uh, but secondly, and more substantively, in some sense, he also had argued that the precise meaning of this hadith is particularly unclear. You know, what kind of imitation is seen as undesirable? Uh, so what? Uh, you know, if an Indian Muslim wears garment associated with Europeans or with some other community. So he had made the argument that both in terms of its chain of transmission and in terms of its desired or intended meaning, revayatan uh, wadirayatan, in both these, uh, you know, from both these perspectives, this uh, whole uh, problem or question is is one that um, if, if one remains uh, attached to this problem, that would hamper and undermine the civilizational progress of the Indian Muslim community. Remember, that was the main category or concept that held together his, uh, you know, intellectual project and his journal, Tahzeeb al Akhlaq, this whole idea of civilizational progress or tarakki. So in responding to Sayyid Ahmad Khan, uh, Qari Tayyib, uh, uh, you know, wrote this extensive uh, but a very biting text Tashabbuf al-Islam, uh, in which his main argument was that, uh, you know, while Sayyid Ahmad Khan is being very dismissive of this issue by saying that this has only to do with, you know, petty things like, can you wear a dhoti or not, uh, which is associated with some, you know, um, uh, Hindus in India, uh, or can you celebrate uh, their rituals of holy Diwali or not, that these are really petty issues that are have no relationship to civil, civilizational progress. So in responding to that, Karitaya makes the point that, 
you know, uh, on the one hand, um, uh, this is a very meaningful doctrine and problem uh, because the very distinction and hence the very identity of Muslims depends on it. Secondly, uh, you cannot be so haughtily dismissive towards external forms of imitation because it is precisely through external imitation that you find internal imitation. And it's precisely through a confused external state in terms of what you wear and so on that it leads to a confused and eventually uh, erased uh, internal uh, attachment uh, to your own faith. Um, and he also makes a very important point um, which connects to the whole Rashid Ahmad Gangohi example of uh, of the English hat that you can wear in England but not in India. So Sayyid Ahmad Khan in his writings on Tashabu had made the argument that, you know, the, one of the reasons why this doctrine or this idea holds no weight or has no importance is that the Prophet himself used, had, you know, worn uh, clothing associated with the Romans, uh, you know, cloak, the Romans, Roman cloaks or, you know, clothing associated with Jews or Christians. So if the Prophet had no problem in wearing clothes which were associated with Romans and, you know, Jews and Christians and so on, then why are we making such a big deal out of this? So in responding to that, Qari Tayyab made the argument um, that when the Prophet wore a cloak which was associated with the, with the Romans, the thing to keep in mind here is that the only reason that cloak was called a Roman cloak is because, um, uh, uh, you know, associated with the Christian community, is simply functionality, that they were the ones who used to produce cloaks at that time. So uh, it's not that that cloak was a marker of distinction for that community. It was not some kind of a marker of distinction for the Christians and so on. It was just the case that, coincidentally, they were the ones who were the main manufacturers and producers of that garment. And if the Prophet wore that garment, it was not with the intention or not even with the implication that it led to uh, the Prophet's imitation of the non-Muslim other. It was just a functional um, outcome because these were the communities that were producing uh, that that product. Similarly, he uh, connected to his own time that, you know, pure soap, pure soap, which is still you know widely available in South Asia and elsewhere, he says, you know, when Indians use pure soap, uh, it's not like they're using it in imitation of the British, a Christian community. It's because the British are well known as producers of pure soap. It's, they just produce it. So it's no, uh, you know, imitation involved here. It's just a, a functional use of a product. That is involved here. Similarly, when you talk about you know Banarasi sari or you know sari is made in Banaras, it's not like you are imitating people from Banaras, uh, especially the Hindus of Banaras. It's just that those saris are associated with Banaras. So this was an interesting kind of a move because the ambiguity of this move is, you know, at what point then does an article of clothing or at what point does a particular kind of habit or practice or form of embodiment come to be so widespread among a community that it can then be deemed as something which is associated with that community, associated with that, with their identity, such that you have to then abstain from it, lest you, uh, uh, lest you uh, 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 engage in the sinfulness of reprehensible imitation or tashabbo. So that was an ambiguity that Qari Tayyib did not address. But the final thing I want to say about Qari Tayyib, and this is a really phenomenal and a very interesting text, and I do a very close reading of it in chapter 6. The final thing that I would say about this text is that, you know, towards the end of this text, after he's been quite polemical and very sarcastic towards Sayyid Ahmad Khan, and before that he does a very deep philosophical reading of why distinction is absolutely critical for identity, um, he, at the very end of this text, he makes the point that, in fact, the foundational stone, as he calls it, of the problem of Tashabu is that of love. That when you are madly in love with an entity, you do all that you can to uh, uh, to, 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 to remain uh, aloof from, to remain distant from any entity that is not your beloved. And hence, Tashabu, or you know, trying to abstain from imitation, was in some ways an expression of prophetic love. That because as Muslims we love the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, 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 to this uh, degree that anything foreign that might uh, that might even uh, hint at some other entity coming in between this, uh, you know, uh, lover-beloved relationship would be seen as something undesirable. 
So love in some ways for him was the foundational stone, the foundational pillar of the importance of abstaining from reprehensible imitation of non-Muslims. So it's very interesting that a seemingly exclusivist you know, doctrine and, and position, how it was framed in the language of love. Uh, so there again, we see that we cannot approach these uh, discourses and these scholars from binaries like, you know, uh, love and enmity or inclusive and exclusive. Uh, uh, these discourses and these visions of um, Hindu-Muslim difference uh, were a lot more sophisticated and interesting than what those binaries would allow. Now, Professor Sherali, to conclude this conversation, this is a question that I really wanted to ask you uh, when I received your book and I opened it and I saw that you have dedicated your work to Sharjil Imam. Now, that for me was a, was a very interesting and a brave choice. But what I would want you to talk about is why were you thinking about Sharjil Imam when writing this book and why did you choose to dedicate your work to him. Now, Sharjil is that Muslim who is viewed by the Indian nation state as the example of the bad Muslim, the Muslim who refuses to be disciplined and domesticated. Because what sets him apart is that he questions the sacralization of the Indian constitution, which he argues has anti-Muslim animus built into it. While this line of critique of the very idea of India is not unique for Kashmiri Muslims, when it comes to the Muslims of India, Sharjil did make a very powerful and potent intervention. So this makes Sharjil a very significant voice. So he does not engage in that romanticization of the pre-BJP India, which is otherwise very pervasive, and he argues that the otherization of Muslims is built into the juridical and social fabric of the Indian nation state. So talk to us about Sharjil Imam and your dedication to him. Well, the main reason I dedicated the book uh, to Sharjil Imam is as a very small gesture of recognizing and paying some tribute uh, to the very difficult uh, but very important struggle that he is fighting against uh, both state injustice, uh, but also against uh, varied forms of uh, liberal secular fundamentalism. Um, so that's the main reason why I, I, I dedicated this book to him. Um, and to also register my debt to his intellectual thought, um, with which I end the book in the, in the epilogue, um, where there was there were two reasons why I engaged with Sharjil Imam in the in the epilogue and with him, and two reasons why I end the book uh, with him. First is that his discussion on questions like uh, 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 the question of what versions of Muslim history, of Indian Muslim history to be more specific, get highlighted and what aspects and what kinds of discourses and scholars. Uh, don't get engaged or get more caricatured or ignored seriously and sophistic and engaged seriously or in a sophisticated fashion. So that discussion of his, uh, uh, which uh, comes from the speeches that he gave right before his arrest, that eventually became the pretext for his arrest as well. Uh, they really show the present significance of the historical uh, actors, texts. Uh, and contexts that are explored and discussed in this book. So, for example, in one of his speeches, uh, Shahjil Imam engages the whole question of cow sacrifice and the Khilafat movement. And he makes the provocative but interesting argument that it was precisely uh, thinkers and Muslim scholars and leaders like Abul Kalam Azad who paved the way for uh, the current um, uh, uh, episodes and... Um, uh, uh, instantiation of Hindu nationalist violence against Muslims on questions like uh, cow protection um, in India today. And his main argument was that by leaving open the avenue for preventing Muslims from cow sacrifice, uh, in which he's of course talking about Abul Kalam Azad's argument and that of other scholars like Abdul Bari, Malvi Abdul Bari as well, uh, 
that Muslims should abstain from cow sacrifice um, as a show of solidarity for uh, uh, Hindu Hindus and the Indian National Congress and Gandhi more specifically, that that uh, left open the avenue of Muslims seizing cow sacrifice and that opened the doors for the current sort of regimes of violence against uh, Indian minorities, especially Muslims, on questions like the cow. And he makes the argument that, you know, why does the opposing viewpoint, that of someone like uh, Maulana Ahmad Raza Khan of the Barelvi School, the founder of the Barelvi School, why does his perspective that, you know, cow sacrifice uh, uh, is not obligatory in Islam, but the main question is here is not whether cow sacrifice is obligatory or is not obligatory in Islamic law, but the main question here is, can Muslims be forced or coerced to abstain from cow sacrifice under the pressure and coercion of um, non-Muslims? So Sharji Imam cites that very text that I analyze in detail in chapter 4 uh, to make the point that, you know, why do these kinds of histories and texts and positions not get highlighted or don't get the same kind of airtime compared to other voices that are seen as perhaps more amenable to a liberal secular project of uh, distinguishing and demarcating the good Muslims and their distinction from bad Muslims. Um, good Muslims being those Muslims who are more easily, uh, um, uh, who more easily fit the very desire of a certain kind of, you know, interreligious harmony or pluralism and so on. Uh, so I, 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 in that chapter, you know, did not agree with all aspects of Sharji Imam's representation of someone like Abul Kalam Azad. And as I show in my chapters, there are perhaps uh, nuances to their argument that might get left out in presenting them as, you know, um, champions of a liberal, secular uh, uh, pluralism and interreligious harmony. But I did find Sharji Imam's provocation to be very, very useful and very important to take note of in terms of how do certain kinds of secular expectations of the present color our view of which fragments and parts of the past are worthy to talk about and are worthy to analyze and worthy of uh, 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 intellectual inquiry, uh, which then provides fodder for political action and, uh, uh, and politics. So I, you know, I find his speeches to be very interesting, very sophisticated. Um, and I, uh, his speeches and his perspectives really uh, provided me with an excellent way to connect the larger argument of this book, which is that we cannot approach Indian Muslim intellectual traditions and discourses on pivotal ethical questions like interreligious friendship or Hindu-Muslim friendship through these liberal secular binaries of inclusive, exclusive, Puritan, pluralist, liberal, fundamentalist, and we also have to take into account and take seriously and try to examine in a sophisticated and nuanced fashion those fragments and those actors and texts from the tradition that don't sit very well with contemporary liberal secular projects of distinguishing good and bad Muslims. That if you really, and this in some ways is the political import of the book as a whole, that if you're really serious about confronting anti-Muslim racism, and Islamophobia in a context like India, uh, one of the important ingredients of that has to be to contend with, to, to, to take seriously and to read on its own terms, even if you maintain critical distance, you know, precisely those discourses from the worldview of the ulama, uh, you know, like uh, Ahmad Raza Khan and others, that sit uncomfortably with modern and contemporary notions of what is a good liberal religious subject, especially a good liberal Muslim subject. So until and unless you, you know, approach these kinds of actors on their own terms, you cannot confront the problem of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim racism. And the point is not to romanticize or to, to, to glorify or to completely embrace and accept any uh, you know, kinds of actors and texts and, and, uh, and, and positions theological or otherwise. But um, it is important nonetheless to take these thinkers on their own terms and to uh, approach them um, uh, in ways that are respectful of the complexity and depth of their thought and are respectful of the, uh, or at least sympathetic to the depth and complexity of their theological and political visions. That I think is the mandate of the academic study of religion.
uh, and especially when it comes to examining you know forms of thought which might seem unseemly for contemporary liberal sensibilities i think the study of religion is an ideal avenue for engaging uh, with these you know fragments from tradition and by doing so confronting and challenging the hegemony and the uh, 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 the power of liberal secular conceptuality so uh, in terms of doing that i found charji limam to be a very important and interesting uh, uh, interlocutor so that's the reason why i end the book with him and to you know pay homage to his uh, fight against injustice of both the hindu nationalist and the liberal secular varieties uh, you know in india and beyond um, that is why i dedicated the book to him thank you so much ahmed for your time this was a lovely conversation with you and thank you so much for the time of your listeners thank you so much professor sher ali tareen this brings us to the end of our conversation and thanks to everybody who tuned in and listened to this conversation Our next podcast hopefully will be on the Palestinian liberation struggle and the promise that it offers. Thank you so much.